So thank you, Mathieu. Goodbye, Mathieu. Jean-Baptiste, if you can come. Hello, Jean-Baptiste. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me. Okay, so Jean-Baptiste is the co-founder and CTO of Screen.io. Uh, you can start to share your screen. Or not. Yes, I'm right there. Okay. We see no. Great. Perfect. No, 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 not one. <laughs> That will be the uh, 2020 code. OK, you don't forget to hide the uh, little toolbar saying that I pop in. Yes, perfect. So you can go full screen. You can, you can hide with the takeaways, which is the, not. Uh, you can hide the uh, top bar if you need to. OK, so I leave a stage to you. Thank you. For listening. Hi, welcome. Um, so we are here to talk about serverless security. And so one thing about serverless is that uh, it's something that is usually hard to see. So the question is how to protect what you don't see. So I'm Jean-Baptiste Avia. I'm CTO and co-founder at Screen. I'm a former member of the Apple Red Team and I, I did lots of reverse engineering and pen testing on the Apple ecosystem and, uh, and platforms. Um, and I'm the host of the AppSec Builders podcast um, where I talk about several uh, different security topics. So first question, before answering uh, how can we secure serverless, we need to understand what is actually serverless. So you are all familiar with what is an application, a monolithic application, I guess. You can think of it as a black box that has inputs and outputs. And this is made of business logic that is written 100% by developers. So if you look at the work needed to maintain a monolithic, a monolithic application, you have a lot of dev and a bit of ops. An evolution of a monolithic application is a microservice app, right? So that's pretty similar. But to maintain that, you need much more ops because your services, they need to communicate together, right? And usually, you want to do so in a safe and secure way. So that's uh, some work from an ops standpoint because you need to install uh, cryptography, uh, mutual authentication, etc. And of course, the evolution that we are uh, looking at right now is the serverless one, right? So instead of having one bin piece or several smaller pieces, now we have much smaller units. And so it means that when the developer still has to write the business logic, the developer still need to also uh, make those unit pieces communicate together. And so this is done through your cloud. Maybe it will use uh, streams or even bridges or databases. But this is now a real part of the business logic. And so this is handled by the developers. And so the amount of uh, ops that uh, a developer will be doing will be much higher uh, with serverless. So we can uh, compare those uh, three approaches on the same uh, view. And we can see that, yes, as we go towards serverless, the amount of code that the developers are writing is smaller, but the amount of ops they are doing grows, right? So we have this uh, shift between developer and operation that is uh, increasing ever and ever. Regarding the usage of serverless, we have two 
main categories. The first one is the ad hoc usage, right? Um, it's straightforward to, to deploy serverless um, services. So you, you can, and it's often required like to dynamically configure cloud elements. You have cloud vendors that require you to use serverless to configure, to transform data or uh, to comply to some requirements. And some teams are, are also using some ad hoc deployment to circumvent heavy processes uh, to don't have to set up a full CI just to go faster, right? And I would say the second usage in terms of serverless are the native serverless applications, where the goal is to build applications designed for serverless infrastructure. So those are really native serverless apps. Now we know um, basically what we are talking about and uh, we, we share the, the same assumptions. So the question would be, how does uh, serverless impact security? So serverless forces bridging dev, sec, and ops. You can see in the monolithic applications, the intersections is pretty small between those, uh, those three worlds, especially in um, not uh, extremely modern development uh, environments. If you take microservices, it's much higher because you need to have a great collaboration between ops and dev to ensure that things are communicating in the best way. And uh, since security now becomes part of the um, software development life cycle, usually security teams are um, embedded in this process. So that's why we see that we have uh, a decent intersection of dev, sec, and ops. But if we move to serverless, this intersection is even more important because we have seen that developers start to do more and more ops, right? And so a lot of concern that um, uh, that were only concerning like the cloud vendors and that was in the territory of ops is now partly moving to the territory of dev because they need those tools to orchestrate their Lambda functions or their serverless functions. Another thing is that we don't have a serverless mental mo model yet because um, what serverless means is moving too fast, right? And we have uh, new things that appear in the serverless world um, day after day. If, if you take a look at the news in the past two months, I think you had three or four new providers that announced that now they were providing serverless at the edge. So uh, we don't have a lot of examples of applications built with serverless on the edge yet, but this is something that will um, evolve, something that will happen. Another thing is that the scale is different with serverless. Usually we were used to monolithic applications or microservices. That's, uh, that's uh, already a decent scale if you are in a large company. But if you take the equivalent of ma five microservices, it could be 100 serverless functions, right? And um, so th th that scale is really, really different. It's hard. Um, to translate your usual thinking in terms of application security into that scale. Also, no tools allow you to visualize all of your lambdas at once, right? Uh, the, the spreadsheet that you had that might have worked for microservices is really, really not the right thing you want to do for serverless functions. And last but not least, uh, the space of serverless didn't reach maturity yet. There are no commonly accepted best practices. You have a broad variety of different best practices. Each cloud vendors are have some uh, different functions. There is no um, perfect overlap, right? If you say I'm doing serverless, it could have a very different meaning depending whether you are using AWS or GCP or Azure or whatever. And of course, this is evolving super fast. So all of that makes that the serverless world is a fast moving world and this is making uh, things super hard to resonate uh, in terms of, uh, of strategy. Also, there is no tool that fits serverless basic security needs, right? If we think about uh, monitoring, for instance, you the cloud vendors offer a lot of uh, monitoring solutions, but they only focus on infrastructure level security, which makes it super hard to understand what your serverless function is actually uh, doing. Also the protection, you could think of web application firewall because 
each cloud vendor offers web application firewall, but it doesn't work for most Lambda source because for most Lambda, because they source events from either queues, either event streams, and um, they are by definition architecturally incompatible with the cloud vendors web application firewalls. So that's something that is uh, pretty hard to uh, to implement on, uh, in the serverless world. So we can compare um, serverless security to, to see um, what's changing. Uh, if we compare to uh, regular uh, applications and, for instance, microservices. So you have some challenges that are solved, right? Th there is some benefit uh, from a security standpoint in moving towards serverless, is that you don't have to do uh, your system updates. Well, unless, you know, uh, last week, I think AWS announced that now uh, with Lambda, you could use your own containers. So that means that if you are doing that, and yes, you still need to do some system updates to ensure that your containers don't uh, use uh, vulnerable packages, of course. And one huge improvement compared to microservices, where you know like zero trust in microservices is pretty, pretty hard because you need to do a mutual authentication and cryptography between all of your services. And so the network level security is solved with serverless because um, if you uh, manage to comply to the cloud best practices, you, you will pull data from uh, something that is already uh, secure from a TLS standpoint, etc. So that's uh, the things that are solved. But you have some new challenges, of course, like you have no way to visualize the deployments of your um, serverless functions. Also, the best practices are still changing very rapidly. The entry points, they vary widely. For all of your microservices, you had either a gRPC or maybe GraphQL or a REST API as an entry point. But <laughs> for serverless, it, it can be whatever your cloud vendors allow you to do, right? Like HTTP, um, queue, stream, database, a lot of different things. And also some um, serverless specific um, communication channels. So that also means that you have a much higher coupling to the cloud provider. And so this requires high cloud security. So cloud security is not really a new challenge, but um, the, the compound of doing serverless on the cloud really requires you to game up your cloud security. And so last but not least, you have some challenges caused by the scale of the serverless, right? If uh, you imagine that uh, developers do 20 times more operations than they used to do, uh, you also need to maybe train your developers or uh, put in place the, the, the right uh, guardrails against uh, against mistakes that they could make. Because usually, a lot of developers will really discover interacting with the cloud when they come to the serverless world. Also, if we assume that one microservice is equivalent to 20 serverless functions, so 20 is, uh, is really a wet finger estimate. Could be two, uh, could be 100, depends. Um, so let's assume it's 20, then you have 20 times the issue of vulnerable dependencies. You have 20 times the issue of ownership tracking, of threat modeling, of uh, new functions appearing. So everything that you were doing from a security standpoint need to uh, be here again, but to move much faster. So what, what can we do? So the cloud security, I said, is even more important, right? But the good point is that it is much simpler than for microservices. So you have to use infrastructure as code, whether it's Terraform or, or CloudFormation, um, but you, you, you cannot rely on uh, making changes in the UI in a non-consistent, uh, non-audited, not reproducible way. So the infrastructure as code is really mandatory. So that's also an opportunity because you can really shift your infrastructure left, right? So with serverless, we know that a part of the business logic is handled by the infrastructure, right? So the serverless app developers, they own both the code, the business logic, and a part of the infrastructure that will orchestrate those business logic together. One thing that you have to do also is to use the principle of least privilege for your lambdas. Right, but of course you want to use the reasonable granularity. You don't want to create one role um, per uh, per serverless function. Otherwise, uh, there is a huge 
issue of scale, you rather want to create one role with a reasonable um, with a reasonable prof security profile that will not allow people to, I don't know, destroy Lambda or create Lambda. You just want one role for your Lambda that will operate, so accessing the database, the streams, and this is it. And last but not least, something that we are not that much used to do in the security teams in the cloud world is to monitor your costs and be ready to block abuses because, yes, each time you run a function, you pay something, so you uh, absolutely need to monitor that. Then one thing that does not change are the typical application threats, right? So you, you want to keep your uh, application security development best practices. If you think of the OWASP top 10, you always have the injections, right? Lambda functions, they are talking to databases, uh, to streams. So the injections are still here. They are still doing uh, API calls. So you still have a risk of SSRF, for instance. Also the vulnerable dependencies, and this challenge is also uh, scaled 20 times. The lack of monitoring, still a big issue in the serverless world. And of course, authorization and authentication issues are really, really important here. That's exactly similar to microservices. Still, there is something that is a bit new, I would say, uh, is the, the scalability, right? So we said one microservice equals 20 serverless functions. So you absolutely need to design strong frameworks to ensure that each of the serverless um, deployments that you have will use the same best practices, the same tools, and that will allow, allow your security program to scale. Last but not least, since things are going 20 times faster, you need to embrace uh, the continuous evolution of the production, right? To do so, you need to leverage the tools that enable it. The good thing is that we are in the cloud usually. So being in the cloud means that you have APIs that allow you uh, to check whatever you want. If you are using infrastructure as code, you can also um, use the cloud APIs to check that the infrastructure uh, as code are coherent, that, that things don't drift, right? And you also want to leverage the developer's tool as much as possible to, for instance, monitor the security controls that are applied, to monitor the permissions that are used, and to ensure that the production doesn't drift versus your um, infrastructure as code. OK, so for some reason, this isn't loading. So serverless security. In a nutshell, if I had to uh, sum up what we what we said before. So you want to maintain the OWASP top 10, right? Your developers still need to think in terms of the OWASP top 10. But at the same time, you want to adopt a strong cloud security posture. Principle of less, least privilege, ensure that all your serverless projects are using infrastructure as code, and leverage the cloud APIs to automate the controls and the monitoring. You want to monitor the serverless cost, and to ensure coherency amongst functions deployments. And so one thing that uh, will help you here is the principle of the paved road. So you want to make it easy for developers to do the safest choice, right? And you do so by preparing a serverless repository template that all of your teams starting a new, either a new a serverless project, either just a single new serverless function, will be able to use. So for instance, you could use the serverless framework or Terraform. And you want to put safe and relevant examples here. OK, this is how you connect to Kinesis. This is how you do an external uh, API call. And that you want it coupled with your CI to check that when something like that is done, it doesn't uh, go out of the way to ensure that, for instance, yes, uh, all the uh, Kinesis things are done with HTTPS, etc. You want to provide relevant and safe code examples again, coupled with the CI to ensure that things don't drift. You want to prepare the provisioning for a working deployment so you are sure that the serverless functions will go through production via uh, your CI. And so you also want to provision things on the CI to run LinkedIn and static analyzer. You want to document how you deploy secrets and use the Git uh, repository best practices. So the takeaways uh, that we exposed here, so the complexity is shifting to the infrastructure, right? The serverless doesn't mean no ops. It means a different kind of ops and also done 
by the developers. Keep in mind that some risks are occurring 20 times more, that the cloud security is much more important than ever, and that scaling your best practices becomes a necessity. So if you have serverless architecture, uh, we are currently working on that. And so we are looking for design partners. So feel free to get in touch uh, with me if you, want to, if you want to test something. I've put on the right all the references uh, on, uh, that I've quoted in that presentation. You can also find more on the last episode of my uh, podcast where we talk about the paved road and so how to scale uh, your usage of frameworks to ensure Uh, that you will provide with your developers with the way to build secure things. And this is what I've said when you should uh, give examples of serverless, of deploys, of CIs, etc. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we are releasing an episode about serverless security as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Baptiste. That was really informative. Uh, you can stop sharing your slides. We can see both of us. Um, Uh, security is definitely a vast topic and it is always a little bit scary for normal people who are not working in security business. Um, and so Jean-Baptiste is just leave. Okay. We had time for a few questions, Jean-Baptiste, if you are still here. Um, so, yes, you're back. Thank you. Um, You talk about the OWASP, so I'm happy to see there is the uh, OWASP serverless. Uh, do you know about some frameworks or open source solution that helps, that will help developers to integrate automatically uh, OWASP, OWASP tests in their CI CD? Or do we have to just take the description of the OWASP and implement it by ourselves? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, you don't have uh, one solution fits all uh, thing that will uh, that will solve the OWASP top 10 forever. Usually, it's a combination of different practices, and so that's really uh, an industry uh, an industry question. So you have several tools that will uh, help you comply to some of the things. For instance, uh, uh, Sneak, uh, GitHub, uh, Screen uh, can all do um, a part of the of the protection. Um, And, but th th they don't overlap, right? One thing that you still need to do usually is to um, ensure that your developers know that uh, the security of their code mm -hmm. is their ownership, right? The, 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 the security team is not the owner of, of, the, of the flows that developers will, uh, will write. So you need to have uh, to, to give that basic uh, understanding to your, uh, to your developers. And I think um, moving on the right and so on the left and ensuring that uh, you do like some threat modeling, some um, uh, you challenge your developers on what they build in a candid way uh, to ensure that they are asking themselves the right question from a security standpoint is the best way to do so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there is no security silver bullets and uh, the last line of, of defense is the developer who write the codes and if there are not uh, I don't know if it's the last line of defense, but it's That's definitely the first one. Maybe the first one, yeah. Yes. It's the first line of defense <laughs> because if you write uh, bad code or if you create really wrong APIs, uh, maybe you won't be able to secure them. Uh, that's great. So it's the end of this uh, session. Thank you very much, Jean-Baptiste, again. Thank you, Arnaud. Session. And uh, so for people who are, who are listening, uh, we'll have the 